Remarks of the President in the Grand Ballroom of the Texas Hotel in Fort Worth, Texas, November 22, 1963. I know uh, now why everyone in Texas, Fort Worth, is so thin, having uh, gotten up and down about uh, nine times. <laughs> this is what you do every morning. Mr. Buck, Mr. Vice President, Governor Conley, Senator Yarborough, Jim Wright, members of the Congressional Delegation, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Attorney General, ladies and gentlemen. Two years ago, I said that, uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. Nobody wonders what Lyndon and I wear. But we're I'm glad to be here in uh, Jim Wright City, about uh, 35... Uh, <laughs> about uh, 35 years ago, a congressman from California, just been elected, received a letter from an IRA constituent which said, uh, during your campaign, you promised to have the Sierra Madre Mountains reforested. You've been in office for one month and you haven't done so. <laughs> well, no one in Fort Worth has been uh, that unreasonable, but in some ways he has had the Sierra Madre Mountains reforested. And uh, here in Fort Worth, he's contributed to its growth. He speaks for Fort Worth. And he speaks for the country. And I don't know any city that's better represented in the Congress of the United States than Fort Worth. And if there are any Democrats here this morning, I'm sure you won't hold that against them. <laughs> Three years ago, last September, I came here on uh, the Vice President and spoke at uh, Burke Burnett Park. And I called in that speech for a national security policy and a national security system which was second to none. A position which said not first, but, if, when, and how, but first. That city responded to that call as it has through its history. And we have been putting that pledge into practice ever since. And I want to say a word about that pledge here in Fort Worth, which understands national defense and its importance to the security of the United States. During the days of the Indian War, this city was a fort. During the days of World War I, even before the United States got into the war, Royal Canadian Air Force pilots were training here. During the days of World War II, the great Liberator bombers, on which my brother flew with his co-pilot from this city, were produced here. First non-stop flight around the world took off and returned here in a plane built in factories here. The first truly intercontinental bomber, the B-36, was produced here. The B-58, which is the finest weapon system in the world today, which it demonstrated most recently in flying from Tokyo to London with an average speed of nearly a thousand miles per hour, is a Fort Worth product. The Iroquois helicopter from Fort Worth is a mainstay in our fight against the guerrillas in South Vietnam. The transportation of crews between our missile sites is done in planes produced here in Fort Worth. So wherever the confrontation may occur, and in the last three years, it's occurred at least three occasions, in Laos, in Berlin, and in Cuba, and it will again. Wherever it occurs, the products of Fort Worth and the men of Fort Worth provide us with a sense of security. And in the not too distant future, <laughs> and in the not too distant future, a new Fort Worth product and I'm glad that there was a table separating Mr. Hicks and myself, a new Fort Worth <laughs> product. <laughs> the TFX, Tactical Fighter Experimental. Nobody knows what those words mean, but that's what they mean. Tactical Fighter Experimental will serve the forces of freedom 
and will be the number one airplane in the world today. There's been a good deal of discussion of the long and hard fought competition to win the TFX contract, but very little discussion about what this plane will do. It will be the first operational aircraft ever produced that can literally spread its wings through the air. It will thus give us a single plane capable of carrying out missions of speed as well as distance, able to fly very far in one form or very fast in another. It can take off from rugged, short airstrips, enormously increasing the Air Force's ability to participate in limited wars. The same basic plane will serve the Navy's carriers, saving the taxpayers at least $1 billion in cost if they built separate planes for the Navy and the Air Force. The government of Australia, by purchasing $125 million of TFX planes before they are even off the drawing board, has already testified to the merit of this plane. And at the same time, it's confident in the ability of Fort Worth to meet its schedule. In all these ways, the success of our national defense depends upon this city in the western United States, 10,000 miles from Vietnam, five or 6,000 miles from Berlin, thousands of miles from trouble spots in Latin America and Africa or the Middle East. And yet Fort Worth and what it does and what it produces participates in all these great historic events. Texas as a whole and Fort Worth bear particular responsibility for this national defense effort. For military procurement in this state totals nearly one and a quarter billion dollars, fifth highest among all the states of the Union. There are more military personnel on active duty in this state than any in the nation save one. And it's not Massachusetts. Any in the nation <laughs> save one with a with a combined military civilian defense payroll of well over a billion dollars. I don't recite these for any partisan purpose. They're the result of American determination to be second to none. And as a result of the effort which this country has made in the last three years, we are second to none. In the past three years, we have increased the defense budget of the United States by over 20%, increased the program of acquisition for Polaris submarines from 24 to 41, increased our Minuteman missile purchase program by more than 75%, doubled the number of strategic bombers and missiles on alert, doubled the number of nuclear weapons available in the strategic alert forces, increased the tactical nuclear forces deployed in Western Europe by over 60%, added five combat ready divisions to the armies of the United States and five tactical fighter wings to the Air Force of the United States, increased our strategic airlift capability by 75% and increased our special counterinsurgency forces which are engaged now in South Vietnam by 600%. I hope those who want a strong America and place it on some signs will also place those figures next to it. This is not an easy effort. This requires sacrifice by the people of the United States. But this is a very dangerous and uncertain world. As I said earlier, on three occasions in the last three years, the United States has had a direct confrontation. No one can say uh, when it will come again. No one expects uh, that uh, our life will be easy. Certainly not in this decade and perhaps not in this century. But we should realize what a burden and responsibility the people of the United States have borne for so many years. Here, a country which lived in isolation, divided and protected by the Atlantic and the Pacific, uninterested in the struggles of the world around it. Here, in the short space of 18 years after the Second World War, we put ourselves by our own will and by necessity 
into defensive alliances with countries all around the globe. Without the United States, South Vietnam would collapse overnight. Without the United States, the CETO alliance would collapse overnight. Without the United States, the CETO alliance would collapse overnight. Without the United States, there would be no NATO, and gradually Europe would drift into neutralism and indifference. Without the effort of the United States and the Alliance for Progress, the communist advance onto the mainland of South America would long ago have taken place. So this country, which desires only to be free, which desires to be secure, which desires to live at peace for 18 years under three different administrations, has borne more than its share of the burden, has stood watch for more than its number of years. I don't think that uh, we are fatigued or tired. We would like to live uh, as we once lived, but history will not permit it. The communist balance of power is still uh, strong. The balance of power is still on the side of freedom. We are still the keystone and the arch of freedom. And I think we will continue to do as we have done in our past, our duty. And uh, the people of Texas will be in the lead. So I'm glad to come. I'm glad to come to this uh, state, which has played uh, such a significant role in so many efforts in this century, and to say that here in Fort Worth, you people will be playing a major role in the maintenance of the security of the United States for the next 10 years. I'm confident, as I look uh, to the future, that our chances for security, our chances for peace, are better than they've been in the past. And the reason is because we're stronger. And with that strength is a determination to not only maintain the peace, but also the vital interests of the United States. To that great cause, Texas and the United States are committed. Thank you. Put it on in the uh, White House on Monday. If you'll come up there, you'll have a chance to see it there. <laughs>